morning. What a delight it is to be here at your wonderful church. I want you to go ahead and take your Bible and turn to those scriptures we saw a moment ago in Romans chapter 16, and just leave your Bible open, and we're going to get there this morning. But thank you for this wonderful invitation to be here to this wonderful choir and orchestra who've led us in worship, and thank you to my dear friend, Dr. Daniel Dickert, for inviting me. Now, I'm going to ask him for a moment just to close his ears and go to his happy place, and let me just talk to you for a moment, can I? Uh, this past week was a Southern Baptist Convention. Prior to the Southern Baptist Convention, there is a large meeting called the Pastors' Conference. It's for all the pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, in case you didn't know it, there are approximately 47,000 Southern Baptist churches. Last year, not this year, but last year, of the 47,000 pastors, they had to pick one person to lead the conference this year. They chose your pastor. And that speaks volumes. And he led well. And when I learned that he was coming to your church, I got excited because I thought, man, you take a great church and a great pastor, that equals great things for the future. And so I am just so honored to be here. I want to talk to you this morning about the principle that changes everything. I want to share with you this morning a principle that is so powerful, if you practice it as an individual, it will change how people relate to you. If you own a business and you practice this principle, it will have a positive effect on your business. And the context that I'm going to share it this morning, if you practice this principle as a church, people will be driving from three counties to be a part of your church. Now, I realize I just set a very high bar for this principle. But I think by the time we finish this morning, you're going to agree with me that it is a principle that changes everything. But before we dive into the principle in the scriptures, let me take you on a journey of how I discovered this principle. My grandmother, my father's mother, lived to be 96 years of age. She said she wanted to live to be 102. And I asked her one day, why do you want to live to be 102? She said, well, I would live, I like to live to be 100 so I can say I did it, and then I'd like to have two years to brag about it. That was my grandmother. <laughs> but as my grandmother, she had a wonderful mind. She taught Sunday school until she was 90. One night, she lived by herself, she cared for herself, and one night, she went to bed, and sometime during the night, slipped into the arms of Jesus. But as my grandmother got older, as she got into her 90s, she developed this habit of saying something, and everybody knew what she meant, but it was not what she said. Let me give you, I have a little book. I started collecting these, and let me give you one or two of my favorites, because I want you to catch the spirit of my grandmother. Uh, the little church my grandmother attended, their pastor became seriously ill, and because of some surgery he was going to have to have, there was a great possibility he may never be able to preach again. So the church was really struggling. Why should a godly man, God called to preach, lose this ability to speak in a way that he could preach? And so they were really struggling. And so the pastor called me and he said, Phil, would you come to our church and would you speak on suffering and how God uses suffering in our lives. And I said, of course. So I went to my grandmother's church and I spoke on suffering and how God uses it in our life. And at the close of the service, my grandmother walked up to me very sincerely, took me by the hand, looked me in the eyes, and she said, son, I want you to know I did not know what suffering was until I heard you preach this morning. I know what she meant, but it wasn't what she said. Let me give you another one. Every time someone heard me preach, they all called my grandmother and told her what they thought about my preaching, good or bad, and my grandmother would immediately call me to report what they said. So one day she called me and she said, son, 
did you preach and call the name of the church? Did you preach there Sunday? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. She said, well, I want to tell you my friend Hazel goes to that church. And I said, yes, ma'am, I met her. She said, well, I want to tell you what she said about your preaching. I said, well, I guess I'd like to know. She said, for me to tell you that the last guest preacher they had preached for one hour and said absolutely nothing, but you did it in 30 minutes. That was my grandmother. She had an unusual view of life. I went to see her one day. She was normally upbeat, but this particular day, I could tell she was feeling kind of blue. And I said, big mother, are you having a bad day? She said, uh, yeah, I'm having a terrible day. I said, do you not feel well? Oh, I feel fine. You're having a, I'm having a terrible day. I said, well, why are you having a terrible day? She said, well, I got up this morning and I started thinking. She said, you know everybody I went to school with is dead? I said, really? She said, yeah, everybody. She went to a small school. Everybody, every one of them I went to school with, they're dead. She said, you know, she came from a big family. She said, no, all my brothers and sisters except one, they're all dead. Everybody in our little church within 20 years of my age is dead. And I'm still here. I said, well, that's wonderful. She said, it's terrible. I said, why is that terrible? Now, my grandmother's name was Lenny. That's an important part of this story. I said, why is that terrible? She said, because I believe they're all in heaven right now sitting around looking at each other saying, I don't think Lenny's coming. I don't think Lenny's coming. <laughs> you get the spirit of my grandmother, right? My grandmother also developed when she got into her 90s a daily routine, and this was her routine. She would get up, she would eat a little breakfast, and then she had four or five friends that she called every day. And after she called those four or five friends, she would eat lunch, and after lunch, she would call those same four or five friends. Then she would eat what she called her supper, and before she went to bed, she called those same four or five friends. Now, here was the problem. You see, my grandmother talked to them two or three times a day, so when she called them, they just kind of picked up the conversation where they left the conversation. Now, here was the issue. If my grandmother called you and you were not one of those four or five friends, she had a tendency to start a conversation in the middle of a conversation. You would have no idea what she's talking about. So one day I'm sitting in Atlanta airport. My cell phone rang. It was my grandmother. That was a bit unusual. Normally I called her. It was rare for her to call me. And I said, hello, big mother. That's what we all called her. And without any words of introduction, she didn't say, son, how are you? Where are you? How's the family? Without any word of introductions, I said, hello, big mother. And she said, son, what's wrong with Obadiah? I had no idea. So I thought, well, maybe somebody in our family is sick, and so maybe she's asking me what's wrong with them. So I thought, well, I can't show my family ignorance because I didn't know anybody named Obadiah. So I decided to deflect her question by asking her a question. I said, well, is he sick? She said, no, he's dead. <laughs> he's been dead for years. I said, Big Mother, we need to start this conversation over. I said, you've asked me what's wrong with Obadiah, now you tell me he's dead. And then my grandmother explained her question. My grandmother had a Bible that she had owned. She got it during World War II when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. If you ever draw attention to her Bible, she would tell you she got her Bible in World War II when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. And my grandmother had developed the habit, because she went to church, you know, all the time. Every time she heard a preacher preach, she would write in the, in the margin his name, the date, and draw a line to the verse he used as a text. Now, my grandmother did that for one reason. She liked for you to be impressed with her memory. <laughs> so, see, she'd walk up to a preacher and say, oh, yeah, I, I remember that sermon. I believe it was... I believe it was September the 15th, 1977, you preached on that text. And I remember, I'd say, Big Mother, you don't remember. You got it written in your Bible. Well, my grandmother, every morning after she had breakfast, she had a little devotional book she used to have a morning devotions. And the little book would suggest a scripture and then have some thoughts for the day. 
And my grandmother used it every morning. Well, this particular morning, my grandmother had gotten out of bed, ate her breakfast, had her devotion, and the text was from the Old Testament book of Obadiah. And when my grandmother finished reading the scripture, she looked in her Bible that she had since World War II when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president, and she realized all the margin was clean. Since World War II and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, my grandmother had not heard one sermon from the book of Obadiah. And she started wondering why. What's wrong with these verses? So she thought, I'll call my preacher grandson and ask him, son, what's wrong with Obadiah? <laughs> but I went to see my grandmother after that, and I asked her if I could flip through her Bible, and I did. And you know, there were passages of scriptures in my grandmother's Bible, like John 3, 16, where she had heard so many sermons, she couldn't know them all. But in my grandmother's Bible, there were books of the Bible, like Obadiah and Nahum, where she had never heard a sermon. There were large sections of books of the Bible, like Ezekiel and Job and Leviticus, where she had never heard a sermon. And there were chapters of the Bible where she had never heard a sermon. And I noted those thinking, you know, maybe we preachers have missed something. And to my surprise, one of the places where my grandmother had never heard a sermon was Romans chapter 16. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go back and revisit some of these, and particularly Romans 16, to see what we missed. Now, I understand why preachers rarely preach from Romans 16, because a quick glance will show you that Paul is making some concluding remarks, which means he is just sending greetings and salutations to a lot of people. It's kind of a South Carolina way of saying howdy to folks. That's all he's doing. So preachers tend to skip over that, but I went back and read Romans 16, and it was then I discovered the principle that changes everything. Now, to give us the biblical basis for it, let me show you just a few verses. Look first in verse 3, where Paul said, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, and to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Notice verse 6. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Juna, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Then notice verse 12. Here are two of my favorite people in the New Testament. They're only mentioned here. I just like them because of their names. They're, there's indication they may have been twin sisters. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Verse 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Now let me ask you. Do you believe that the early Christians loved the Apostle Paul? Well, of course you do. You can't read the New Testament and book of Acts without seeing how deeply people cared and loved for Paul. In fact, one of the most moving passages in all the book of Acts is when you go to Paul is on his final missionary journey. He goes to Ephesus. He spends time there, and then it's time for him to depart. The Scripture says that all of the Ephesian elders went with him down to the ship. They prayed together, and after they prayed, Paul told them they would not see his face anymore this side of heaven. And the Bible says they fell on his neck and wept. You don't weep when someone's leaving unless you love that person. People loved Paul. But do you know why people loved Paul? It was because Paul loved people. Here's the principle that changes everything. People love people that love people. In fact, would you say that out loud with me? People love people that love people. Now, if I ask you, do you love people? Well, of course you would say yes. I mean, if we went around the room, had everybody stand, and I said, do you love people? Yes. Do you love people? Yes. Nobody would stand and say, I'd like to testify I hate everybody. Nobody in their right mind would do that because if you felt that way, you wouldn't be here. But we say we love people, if I ask a church, do you love? of course we love people. So the issue is not do we love people. 
It's how do we cause people to feel loved? How do you make someone know you love them? Well, Paul in Romans 16 does three little simple things that made people feel love. Same things you can do. Here's the first one. Love appreciates people. Love appreciates people. You know, when I read Romans 16, my first thought was when I read it, because remember, Paul had not been to Rome. He went later, but when he's writing Romans, he'd never been to Italy, never been to Rome. And I thought, I know what he's doing. I bet Paul knows in his heart someday he's going to go to Rome. I bet if I research these people, and there are approximately 27 people he mentions, I bet if I research these people, I'm going to discover that these are wealthy people, they're you know, uh, political leaders, they're civic leaders, they're influential people. So I know what Paul is doing. Paul is saying hello to these people. So when he goes to Rome, they can help launch his ministry. So to my surprise, of the 27 people Paul mentions, half were women or slaves. In Roman culture, a woman and a slave had no standing. I often wonder how can I convey how Romans felt about women and slaves and the best way I can explain it to even maybe touch the hem of the garment of the understanding, it would almost be the equivalent of how Americans view dogs and cats. I mean, we love them, we like them, but dogs and cats have no legal standing. They, they can't do anything legal. They're, and that's the way the Romans viewed women and slaves. So let me put that another way. Half of the people Paul mentions can do nothing for him or to him. The real test of love is how do you treat people who can do nothing for you or nothing to you? See, people know, do you want something from me? And they know when they can do nothing for you or to you, do you still appreciate those people. I have a dear friend named Maury Scobie. That name doesn't ring a bell to you until I tell you what Maury Scobie did. Maury Scobie devoted his adult life to doing the one thing he believed God called him to do. He was the personal aide and assistant to Dr. Billy Graham. Now, I realize that maybe we have younger people here who don't know as much about the ministry of Billy Graham, but let me just tell you that Billy Graham was the most influential preacher that probably has lived in the last 100 years. Literally, this man traveled the world preaching in stadiums many times of more than 100,000. In fact, on one occasion in Seoul, South Korea, he spoke to one million people in person. He was friends with all the world leaders including every president that we had from Harry Truman until the time that Dr. Graham died. All of those were people he influenced. They sought his counsel. He was a godly, influential preacher. Maury Scobie was his assistant who always made sure he got his clothes on the plane, the books he needed. Whole life, Maury chose not to marry so he could devote himself to being Dr. Billy Graham's aide and assistant. And one day we were having lunch and I said, Mario, I know you get asked a lot about Dr. Graham, but I, I, I have a unique question. And I know you're gonna tell me he was a godly man, walked with the Lord, I know all that. But was there any characteristic that Billy Graham possessed that few people possess? And without hesitation, he said, yes, sir, and I can tell you what it is. The man truly appreciated everybody. He said, Phil, do you know when we travel, You couldn't get him, we get on a plane, you couldn't get him to a seat because he had to thank the pilots and the flight attendants, even if they didn't know who he was, he didn't care. He just wanted to know, he appreciated them. You go to a hotel, he he wanted the front desk people to know, he appreciated them. He had to thank the, the people who were cleaning the room. He said, and when we'd go to stadiums, we would have to try to pick a route because if he saw a first responder or an usher, he would go over and say thank you. So it's no surprise if you go to the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you do research, you will discover that of 
all the letters Billy Graham wrote in his life, over 75% was to tell somebody, thank you. Now, let me ask you. Do you think the reason why world leaders wanted to hear from Billy Graham, do you think the reason people, when they heard him speak, wanted to hear his message, could it be because they saw in him a man who loved people for who they were and not for what they could do for him? You start appreciating people other people ignore. You just start expressing your gratitude for people nobody pays attention to. You start appreciating people for who they are, you're gonna be amazed how people will change their reaction to you because love appreciates people. Let me tell you a second thing. Love acknowledges people. You know, if I'd been writing the book of Romans, Romans 16 would have looked a little different. It would have been one verse and it would have said, tell all my friends, hello, period. I wouldn't have taken the time to list everybody. And I would be writing with a modern computer. Paul was writing with primitive writing instruments. In fact, if you think about it, he was a prisoner. And if he's actually writing or if he had a scribe, someone doing it for him as he dictated, whatever the case, they, he was in prison, so he's probably getting the writing instruments other people have thrown away. As a matter of fact, an archaeologist wrote that it probably took Paul as long as one minute to write one letter of the Greek alphabet. That minute took him nearly 30 minutes to write Tryphena and Tryphosa's name. But you know why he did it? Because love acknowledges people. Let me ask you a question. You ever had friends that maybe went to church here and due to their job or some other reason, they had to move to another city? But you've kept up with them. You've talked to them about how they've adjusted to, you know, their new place, of res- their new residence. And, and maybe you ask them this question. Well, have you found you a new church home? And they'll say something like this. Well, not yet. We visited a lot of churches. And they'll start telling you about all the churches. We went to this church. The music was good. Preaching was weak. Went to this church. Preaching was good. Music's weak. Went to this church. They have no clue what they're doing. We went to this other, you know, you just, they just tell you all about these churches, But then they'll say something like this, and we went to this one church, and we liked the music, we liked the preaching, but we're never gonna go back. Why? Why why won't you go back? You know the number one reason you're gonna hear why people don't go back to a church? The number one reason, nobody spoke to us. Why does that offend people? I mean, think about it for a moment. I've never heard a single person in my life say something like, Well, you know, I got thrown in jail the other night, but we're not going to go back to the jail because nobody spoke to us. (laughs) But when people come to church and no one speaks, why does that offend people? It's because we all know subconsciously, I guess, that if I'm important to you, you will acknowledge my presence. And when people refuse to acknowledge you, body language says, I don't care anything about you. In essence, it's interpreted as, you really don't love me. Now, do you know the Bible says there are two ways we are to acknowledge people, especially when they come to church, but you do this in life, and what's the difference? The first is what Paul does here John wrote in 3 John specifically that we are to call the brethren by name. We're to call each other by name. You want to acknowledge someone and watch the impact? You call them by name. See, everybody in this room would say, because we're in church, that Jesus is the sweetest name we know, but the second sweetest name you know is your name. When someone calls you by name, Man, you stand a little taller. You you feel special because your name encompasses everything you are. Now, I know when I tell people that, if you don't believe it, just start calling people by, by their name every time you see them. In fact, I have a lot of friends who have run for political office at the state level and federal offices, and you know what they tell me, especially at the federal level, they try to train you on what to do and what not to do, and one of the things they teach candidates is when you meet someone, say their name three times in the course of the conversation. Daniel, it's good to meet you. Daniel, it's great to be with you. Daniel, God bless you. See you, Daniel. 
Because studies show that if you call somebody's name and you're running for office, if you call their name at least three times in the first conversation, the, the odds of them voting for you go up exponentially. That's the power of calling someone's name. But see, here's what somebody will say to me after the sermon now. Brother Phil, I agree with you, but I just got to tell you, I'm not good with names. To which I will respond, really? You're not good with names? You have problems remembering people's names? Oh, I do, Brother Phil. I just can't remember people's names. Okay, then would you tell me how you find it possible to remember the names of everybody who owes you money? <laughs> Brother Phil, there's a guy here in Columbia. He owes me $5,000, and for the life of me, I can't remember his name. No. <laughs> Now, I know what people mean when they say that. What you mean is, I'm afraid I'll call someone the wrong name and I'll be embarrassed. But as, can I tell you from experience from someone who's gotten a lot of people's names wrong? If you get their name wrong and it was a sincere mistake and you made the effort, it has the same effect as if you called them the right name because you tried. There's something about people hearing their name that makes them feel loved. But you said there were two ways, Phil. You're right. The other one is right here in verse 16, in Romans 16. Now, I'm quoting the Bible. This is not my opinion. It says, greet each other with a holy kiss. It's right there. I didn't write it. Of course, this was pre-COVID. I understand. But, but when you read that verse, do you mean, Phil, that we are to kiss people? No, that's the way the Romans greeted each other. If you've watched maybe documentaries, you know, they would kiss each other on the cheek. That, that's not how we do it. So what is the equivalent in our society? It's the same as shaking a hand or hugging a neck. Man, Joe, it's good to see you, man. You hug their neck. I, I tell you, Amy, it's so good to see you, and you hug their neck. You know there's something about that that makes that person feel loved. There's something about just shaking a hand, touching someone, patting their shoulder. It makes them feel loved. So Paul said, we're to greet each other. Yeah, call each other by name, but make people feel welcomed. Love acknowledges people. Let me tell you a third thing. Love affirms people. Did you notice what Paul did in this writings. He, he didn't just say, well, greet Priscilla, Quilla, Juna, Andronicus, Mary. No, he didn't make a list. Notice what he did. He said, greet Priscilla and Aquila, and he started bragging on them. You know, he was telling the Romans, they risked their life for me one time. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila knew that. Paul's bragging on them to the Romans. And, and say hello to Juno and Andronicus. You guys don't know it, but, but the apostles talk about them. And besides, they came to Christ before I did. And, and say, Mary, that woman has done so much for the Lord, and Trifina and Trifosa. And say hello to Rufus and his mother. She's been like my own mama. That's literally what Paul said. You see what Paul's doing? He's bragging on those people. He is sincerely affirming them. Hey, you want to attract people around you, you just start bragging on people. I, I don't mean flattery. I don't mean things that aren't true, but sincerely looking for the good points and telling people what they are. Because, see, that's what love does. Love looks for the best in people. Let me tell you how I, I discovered that. My wife, Debbie, and I, we have five grandchildren. Now, to a lot of people in the room... <laughs> When you hear any speaker mention grandkids, you go, oh, Lord. I mean, because you just, you just know they're going to talk about their grandkids. Well, get ready. That's what I'm about to do. Um, everybody loves to talk about their grandkids. Now, for those of you who don't have children, and maybe your children are young, and you're having a hard day, just take it from me, and there'll be a course of amens when I say this. People have grandchildren. You just hang in there with your kids. Someday they'll give you grandkids, and you will discover that grandchildren are God's rewards for not killing your kids. That's exactly what it is. Can I get an amen? Amen. See, that's true. Now, I don't have a verse for that, but it's true. But, but we have five grandkids. Our two oldest are our two oldest granddaughters. One of them 
loves to play soccer. The other one doesn't like sports. She loves dance and the theater. So when I'm home, if there's a soccer game, we go to the soccer game. If there's a play, I always try to be there. And I got to tell you what I found myself doing when they started doing that. After a soccer game, I'd, I'd be with friends and I'd say, well, I'm not saying it because Zoe's the best one on the team. But I mean, I'm not saying it because she's my granddaughter, but she is the best one on the team. <laughs> I'm not saying it because Emery's my granddaughter, but you know, them other kids just can't act like she does. And one day my wife said, you know you're lying. <laughs> you're saying it because they're your grandkids. So I just dropped that part. Now I just say, you know, Zoe's the best one on the team. <laughs> Emery's the best actor. You know why I say that? Because I believe it. And you know why I believe it? Because I have something in front of my eyes called a grandfather's love, and everything they do, I see through the filter of that love. So I don't see the times she messes up. I don't see the times they misalign. No, I only see perfection. Hey, when you love people, it means you got a filter in front of them. You don't see their faults. You see their good points. And let me tell you, you want to watch people bloom, you just start saying to people, nice things. I, I mean, people that interact in your life every day, I mean, if they just do something nice. I, I've been in places where maybe, you know, I fly a lot and, you know, people who fly a lot, we, we have a tendency not to be the nicest people in the whole world. And I've been in line and maybe the person in front of me just really blast the gate agent. Well, ain't not the one that messed the plane up, but they take the heat. And so the next time, you, you just step up and say, look, I, I know that was pretty rough, but I want you to know I appreciate you because you smiled the whole time he was saying those unkind things, and I noticed. Thank you. You know how many times when I fly, people will say, I remember you. And I, I'll say, you do? Oh, Yeah. I had a lady tell me one time, you don't realize I was having the worst day of my life a few years ago, and you just stopped and said, thank you. Now, that doesn't make me the hero of the story. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to illustrate the point that if you just take time to acknowledge people's good points, you'll be amazed at the effect because love affirms people. Let me tell you a story of a little five-year-old boy who got this principle. His dad is a pastor and a dear friend, and at the time this happened, his son was five years old. For reasons known only to the Lord, from the time his son was four years of age, he had always just been impressed with the garbage man. He just, he said, I've never seen a kid. He's just in awe of the garbage man. So he said, you know, six days a week, he wanted to sleep late, but on Wednesday morning, the garbage man ran, and he was up early, and he would quickly eat his cereal, and he would stand out front on the front steps and awe oh, as he got the garbage. And someone had told him that the garbage man's name was Bill, and so he would stand out there, and he'd wave and say, hey, Mr. Bill, hey, Mr. Bill, and the garbage man would wave, and then he'd go play. Well, Christmas came the year he was five years of age. They were making out their Christmas list, and the little boy said, Mama, we need to get the garbage man a present. She said, well, we don't normally get the garbage man a present. But preacher dad saw a teachable moment. So, well, I tell you what, why don't you and your mother bake some cookies and we'll give them to the garbage man for Christmas? Well, that's a great idea. So just before Christmas on that Tuesday night, they baked the cookies and the next morning, boy, he was up real early. He was anxious, and his dad said, now, you can't go to the street. I'll have to go with you. So when you see the garbage man coming, you let me know. <laughs> a few minutes, he said, he coming, Daddy. He coming. He coming. Okay, get the cookies. So the little boy got the paper plate, cookies, a little paper towel on top. And he and his preacher dad walked to the street. The garbage man stopped the truck, and he got out. He looked at my pastor friend and said, sir, is something wrong? Oh, no, nothing's wrong. He said, you probably have noticed my son's a little in awe of your line of work. Oh, yeah, he's always there waving. Well, he and his mom last night baked some cookies, and we want to give them to you as a Christmas gift. And the little boy walked over to the garbage man and handed him the cookies, and he said, Merry Christmas. 
And then my pastor friend said, I don't know where this came from, but he said, thanks for getting our garbage. It would sure stink around here if you didn't. <laughs> garbage man put the cookies in the truck. And when he turned around, it was a tear trickling down. He wiped it away. And he said, you know, I don't think anybody's ever given me a Christmas present just because I'm the garbage man, but thank you. He looked at my pastor friend. He said, sir, what's your line of work? What, what, what do you do? He said, well, I'm the pastor of a Baptist church down the road. And do you and your family go to church? Well, I'm sorry to say that it's just me and the wife. And No, we don't. But we might come to your church sometime. The little five-year-old said, hey, this Sunday before the service, my preschool choir is going to sing before the service. If you come hear me sing, I'll sit with you during church. <laughs> he said, we might do that. My pastor friend said he looked up that morning and coming into the auditorium was the garbage man and his wife. And the little preschool choir sang and just as he promised, the little boy went and sat with them during the service and the close of the service and people have told me this story so many times, that little boy had the garbage man and his wife taking them around and introducing them to everybody and said, this is Mr. Bill, best garbage man in town right there never spills any garbage. <laughs> well, I don't have to tell you who came back to church the next week, do I? And it was in January, my pastor friend got a call in from the garbage man and said, would you stop by our house? We want to talk to you. And they said, you know, we went to church when we were younger, but we've never really given our life to Christ. And my pastor friend led the garbage man and his wife to Christ. They were baptized, they're active in that church, and I met the garbage man and his wife. But why are they in church today? Because a five-year-old got it. He understood that love took time to appreciate people, the garbage man, to acknowledge people. Hey, Mr. Bill, to affirm people, best garbage man in town. And a five-year-old led a garbage man and his wife to the foot of the cross. The principle works. You remember what it was? People love people that love people. Would you say that with me out loud? People love people that love people. Now our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Our musicians are coming and in just a moment we're going to stand and we're going to have a time of invitation. You've seen that, I'm sure, before here at your church. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, and I know that hasn't been the focus of my sermon, but there would be no greater joy to, to Pastor Daniel or any of the staff than to share with you how Christ can come into your life. There are some of you maybe here today and you've trusted Christ and you need to follow him in believer's baptism. I'm going to invite you to come too. Maybe you've been visiting and this is the place where you want to call your church home and I want to encourage you to come and tell one of the staff, I want to be, we want to be part of this church. But my message today has been targeted to Christians. You know, your church is starting on a new journey with new pastor and new staff coming on board. So here's my challenge and I want to ask you. Do you want to be a church that loves people like Paul loved people? Do you want to be a person who loves people like Paul loves people? Sometimes that means we have to get outside of our little comfort zone. Sometimes it feels awkward the first time you tell somebody thank you or you appreciate them or you work at learning someone's name and calling their name of saying something affirming about them? Maybe it's uncomfortable, but oh, let me tell you, the difference it makes, it's a principle that changes everything. And it may have been a long time since you've walked down an aisle. But you know what I think would make this one of the best Father's Day ever? If, if every person here today would examine your heart, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're a man or woman, teenager, boy, girl, doesn't matter, 
And today you want to say, I want to love people like Paul loved people? I'm going to invite you in a moment just to leave that comfort zone of where you are. And there's going to be staff across the front along with the Pastor Daniel. And I just want you to come and say to one of them, I want to love people like Paul loved people. You can go back to your seat. You say, well, what's so significant about that? Because see, when you come, other people are going to see that you're making that commitment and they're going to make the commitment. And man, can you imagine what happens if just the people in this room start loving people like Paul loved people, the difference it's going to make in your church community in this city? But it all starts with you. So I'm going to ask you, would you be willing to do that today? I want you to. I want you to go ahead and make your mind up. You're going to do it. It'll just take a moment. Staff will be here, and you can come to one of them or Pastor Daniel. I just am coming because I want to love people like Paul loved people. Father, we've shared the message. I pray now that as we stand <laughs> literally across this room, that from senior adults to teenagers and boys and girls would come to say, just real quickly, I, I want to love people like Paul loved people. Because see, now the Holy Spirit, once we've done that, can remind us we made that commitment. And we start practicing it. So, Father, I thank you as people are making their way right now to make that commitment. For we're asking it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.